Okay. Um, hi. Today we uh, will continue our discussion of uh, the issues related to work and energy. Uh, so, you know the definition of work. Work delta A is defined as scalar product of vector F by vector of displacement of a material particle. So if we have a material particle which is displaced from its original position to some final position, and if vector F was acting on this particle during all the time of displacement, then by definition work is the scalar product of these two vectors, the net force acting on the particle and the particle displacement. And according to definition, the scalar product is the product of the magnitudes of these two vectors by cosine alpha. Alpha, the angle between the two vectors. If the displacement is very small, we will define, we will denote the displacement as dr. And then the amount of work will be denoted as delta r, delta, delta a, which will be a scalar product of force and vector dr. This is for very small displacement, and we assume that vector f was constant uh, during the particle motion uh, at this distance dr. What if the particle motion is large? large compared to dr. What if the particle moves along some arbitrary trajectory? So the particle moves in arbitrary way, and uh, the force changes, the force acting on the particle changes, as it's usually the case. And the vector alpha uh, and the angle alpha between the force and the displacement changes all the time. So at this point, at this point, force F may be directed here, and angle may be this one. And at some other point, the force could have been absolutely different. It could have been directed this way, and the angle was different. How can we calculate work in this uh, general case? The method to calculate work is very simple. We actually divide this path of the particle into small intervals, into small intervals. Each interval is denoted by dr. And the force will be a function of point, a function of space point, a function of radius vector. And also, angle alpha will depend on, on the point. It will be different in different points of the trajectory. And uh, in this case, a small amount of work performed on the displacement of particle dr reflects only a small amount of work performed just on a small part of the trajectory. If we want to find the total work, we have to add all works, all the all work amounts uh, on all the uh, parts of this path. So total work will be given as a sum of all elementary works. amount of work number one, amount of work number two, et cetera, amount of work number k, and we sum up all these amounts of work performed on all the uh, displacements of the particle, on all elementary displacement. Certainly, this sum is denoted in mathematics as an integral, 
of dA. And the integral should be taken along the path of the particle. So if the particle started from initial point A and ended at final point B, then we have to take this integral along the path of the particle from point A to point B on its displacement along, along the path. And generally speaking, this integral will depend on the trajectory. If, if particle goes along one trajectory, we will obtain one uh, amount of work performed. If particle chooses to work along some different path, then the final answer here will be different after we sum up all the works performed at different displacements. So uh, this integral is called a curvilinear integral. A curvy, curvilinear integral. That is the integral taken along the curved path of a particle. In mathematics, there is a whole a well developed mm, apparatus methods to calculate such integrals along, taken along any curve in space and time, any curve in space and time. So this is just the general definition and uh, what may be the uh, practical calculation of this integral it depends on, on a particular situation in, in certain problem. Uh, if uh, some force, some net force acts on a particle of mass m, then there is a second Newton's law which says that the force depends on the mass and acceleration. Okay, guys, tell me, please, reveal, please, the secret. Why are you so late? Please explain. Another class? I have class before. And finish at 55, it's to finish at 55. I see. OK. So uh, according to the second Newton's law, which we know very well, a net force acting on the particle defines the particle acceleration. Now if we recall the definition of work, according to definition of work, in order to calculate work, we have to multiply force by dr, by elementary displacement, by the vector of displacement. And this should be a dot product or a scalar product. So I will multiply this equation by vector dr. After that, I will obtain f multiplied by dr equals m dv dt scalar product by dr. What is dr divided by dt? This is just the velocity of the particle, a vector of velocity by definition, dr divided by dt is vector of velocity. So what we have here, am v dv. I will continue this uh, formula by writing d of v squared over 2. If I take a differential of this function, then 2 and 2 will cancel, and what remains here will be v dv. So according to the rules uh, to differentiate, uh, rules of differentiation of functions, this expression can be written as this one. And uh, also, the mass as a constant can be taken inside the differential 
sign. So I will have a differential of m v squared over 2. And this is, by definition, a, a kinetic energy. This is a kinetic energy. So this is a differential of kinetic energy dk. By definition, this expression is known to be a kinetic energy of a particle. And this, by definition, is a small amount of work delta A. Look here at this formula. DA, delta A, by definition, is scalar product of vectors of force and displacement. So looking at this derivation, we obtain the result delta A an amount of work performed on the particle by some force F equals the change of kinetic energy of this particle. And after integrating this expression, we will obtain that work performed on a particle during some time interval will be equal the change of kinetic energy, final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. That is a theorem on the change of kinetic energy of a material particle. This is a theorem. In order to prove this theorem, we started from the definition of work, elementary work, and we discussed how to calculate the work if the particle moves along arbitrary trajectory, along arbitrary curve. We discussed how to calculate this curve, curvilinear integral. So we understand what is the total work performed by a force acting on the particle, whatever the path of the particle is. And after that, we have proven that this total work performed on the particle by some external force equals the change of kinetic energy of the particle. That is the theorem on the change of kinetic energy of a material particle. What if we have many particles? What if, there are, what if there are many particles in a system of particles? Let's consider a system of particles. Particle m1, particle m2, et cetera, et cetera, particle mk. Some system of many particles. In this case, the total kinetic energy of the system of particles, by definition, is the sum of kin kinetic energies of each individual particle. So this is a sum over kinetic energies of all particles, mk, vk squared over 2, and the sum is taken over all the particles, all the numbers k. I don't specify here that k changes from 1 to n, total number of particles. You understand it. This is the sum taken over all the particles. What will happen if there are some forces acting on this si system of particles? Each force acting on certain particle will perform work. If we know the force and if we know the displacement of the particle, we will find the elementary work. And we have just proven that this elementary work is the change is equal to the change of kinetic energy of this particular particle. So if we sum up all the works performed on all the particles by all the forces acting on each particle, then we will obtain the sum of change of kinetic energies. That is the total, the sum of change of total kinetic energy of the system of particles. So the total work 
So the total change in the kinetic energy of the system of particles will be obviously equal to the total work performed on all the particles by all the forces, including internal forces and external forces. And at this particular point, I will discuss this issue. What will happen if we consider separately external forces and internal forces? Internal forces will perform work which I will denote by A with the symbol I, indicating that this work was performed by internal forces acting between the particles in this system, the forces acting between the different particles. And also there are external forces, and they will perform some external um, work with, which, we, which will be denoted by A with this index, uh, index E, indicating that this work was performed by external forces. It's not a single force. This, is, this work was performed by different forces acting on different particles, so this is a total sum of all works performed on each individual particle. When we considered the theorem on the motion of a center of mass of the system of particles, we obtained such a result. Looks like the second Newton's law. But this is not the force acting on some individual particle, on some in single particle. No. If, if we, when we considered the motion of the center of mass, we understood that this is a vector sum of all forces acting on the system, on different parts of the system. So this is a vector sum of forces applied to different points, to different points of the same system of material particles. And this is the total mass of the system of particles. And this is not the velocity of some single particle, but the velocity of the center of mass, center of mass of the system of particles. And when we proved this theorem on the motion of the system of mass, of the center of mass of the system of particles, we discovered that we have to take into account only external forces, because all internal forces of interaction within the system will cancel due to the third law, Newton's third law. All the internal forces will cancel. So here we take into account only external forces in the theorem of the motion of the center of mass. But when we talk about work, the forces will not cancel because work, any a uh, small amount of work is not a force. It's a force times dr times displacement, scalar product. This is not a force. If all internal forces cancel due to a third law of classical mechanics, then the uh, small amounts of work will not cancel because different forces are applied to different points, and different points will have different displacements. And so, uh, all, the f all the forces will perform different works, but they will not cancel in general case. So if in the theorem of the motion of the center of mass, we must take into account only external forces, then in this when we calcula calculate the change in kinetic energy of the system of material points, we have to take into account both external and internal forces. In this case, uh, the work performed by internal forces will not cancel, in general case. Uh, let's consider, anyway, two particles like M1 and M2. And let these particles interact somehow. This is just, these are two particles of the system of particles. There may be thousands and millions of particles in the system, but we consider just any two particles. And let them interact somehow 
for example, let it be a repulsion. Let's say interact with some forces of repulsion. This is the force acting on mass M2. And this is the same force, but with minus sign acting on particle M1. These two forces, according to the third law of classical mechanics, are equal in magnitude and differently oppositely directed. The two forces are oppositely directed and equal in magnitudes. So the force acting on the first particle from the second particle equals just with the sine minus equal to the force acting on the second particle from the first particle. And let's consider possible displacements of these particles. We need displacements because a displacement is included, is contained in the definition of work, of elementary work. Here is the displacement. So we need to consider displacements. OK, let it be the displacement dr2 of the second particle. And let, uh, let it be the displacement dr1 of the first particle. Work performed on the first particle will be dr1 equal to scalar product of minus f times displacement dr1. And displacement dr1 can be decomposed into two components, one perpendicular to the direction of force, and another displacement, another part of displacement uh, directed along the line of forces. So we understand that if we take scalar product, then this perpendicular component will, will play no role Absolutely no, it may not be taken into account because the angle here between the displacement, perpendicular displacement, and the force is 90 degrees, and the cosine of 90 degrees will be zero. So perpendicular displacement will not, uh, will not influence the work. It will not perform the work. Only the displacement directed along the uh, force direction should be taken into account. And I will denote this displacement as delta 1. So this will be minus f delta 1. Now, not vectors, but uh, scalars. I take the magnitude of force f and delta 1, because delta 1 is just dr1 cosine alpha 1. This is angle alpha 1. This expression dr1 cosine alpha uh, is included in the definition of work and the definition of scalar product. And so if I calculate dr1 cosine, I will, I will obtain just this displacement delta 1. That will be the result. That will be the force uh, acting on the first particle and the work performed by this force uh, when the first while the first particle is displaced at some distance dr1. The same consideration may be applied to the second particle. We may decompose the displacement into two directions. The perpendicular direction plays no role because of this angle. Mm, right angle will give you zero cosine. So we have to take into account only this part of displacement and so the work performed on the second particle will be f delta 2. And total work performed on both particles, delta A1 plus delta A2, will be equal to f. I must add these two expressions, and I will obtain f multiplied by delta 2 minus delta 1. When this expression is equal to 0, when this expression is 0, only when delta 2 equals delta 1. Delta 2 equals delta 1. 
then the force, then the total work of internal forces acting on two particles will be zero. And we may consider this interesting situation when delta 2 equals delta 1. Look at this picture, delta 2 equals to delta 1. It means that the distance between the two material points in M1 and M2 has not changed. The distance between these two material points, M1 and M2, remains constant while the particles move. The distance remains constant. Only in this case, the displacement delta 2 will, will equal to the displacement of delta 1. And when the distance is constant between the two points, in general case, when these two points belong to a solid body, when this is when the material particles form a solid body. Then inside the solid body, the distance between any two points remains constant, no matter how, how this body moves, how it rotates. The distance between any two points inside the solid body remain constant. And only in this case, we will have the displacements equal so that the distance between these two points is constant. And only in this case, we will have the work of internal forces equal to zero. So this general formula for the change of kinetic energy of a system of material particles, this general formula will be reduced to something more simple. The change of kinetic energy will be equal to the work of external forces only. If we consider the motion of solid body only for solid only for solids, only for solid bodies, solids. <coughs> so if we have a solid body moving in any way, then the change of kinetic energy of this solid body will be defined by the action of external forces only. We will not have to take into account the action of internal forces, the interaction between different parts of the solid body. But if the body under consideration is not solid, if it's somehow deformable, then the distance between different parts of this solid body will, ch will change in the process of its motion. And then the work performed by internal forces will not be zero. So if the body under consideration is not a solid body, then we have to take, then we have to use this general formula and we have to take into account both the work of internal forces and the work of external forces. But if we have a solid body, then we have to take into account only the work of external forces. That's a theorem on the motion, a theorem on the change of kinetic energy of a system of material particles. So today, we have just considered two theorems. The first was a theorem on the change of kinetic energy of a single material particle. And then we considered another theorem these two formulas for two possible cases, a theorem on the change of kinetic energy of a system of material bodies, not a single particle, but many particles, a system of material bodies. A system of material bodies, it can be anything. It can be a solar system cons consisting of many planets and comets. It may be uh, uh, some portion of liquid. It's also a system of material points. If it's liquid, it's not solid. And then this formula should be taken into account. If it's a system of planets, if it's a solar system, again, it's not solid body. This formula should work in this case. But if it's a rigid wheel just rolling on the road, this is a solid body which moves somehow, then this formula should be taken into account. Then only external forces should work. 
But in general case, both external forces and internal forces perform some work. Dima, можно тебя попросить? Now we will, now we will see, uh, now I will demonstrate you <coughs> some experiment which, you know, which demonstrates the work performed by internal forces. We will consider the system of bodies, two bodies, a load, which is now lifted upward, and the earth. Two bodies interacting. The earth pulls the load downward with the force of gravity, and the same force, according to the third law of Newton, is applied to the earth. But the earth acceleration is negligible. The earth acceleration is negligible, and the acceleration of this body will be quite observable because the mass is much smaller than the mass of the Earth. Anyway, if we consider the system of two bodies, the Earth and the load, this is some two material points interacting, and the force of interaction, the gravity force, is the internal force of interaction between two bodies, and this internal force certainly performs work if the load is allowed to move. And this work may, may show itself in different ways. This work may result in acceleration of this body, and that will be a free fall acceleration, a fall down, down with free fall acceleration. Or there may be other situations when this work performed by force of gravity may be transformed into some other sort of energy. And in, this is the case in our situation. Uh, this, uh, uh, so this work performed by a gravity force will rotate a dynamo and some electric current will be generated and electric current will flow through this lamp and the lamp will just glow and you will see the light. So the work performed by internal forces acting in this system of two bodies, the earth and the load, this internal work, internal forces work, will be uh, transformed into the energy of light, which is the energy of heat, because the filament will be heated, and therefore we'll see the light start. OK, start it. So it goes down, and you see the lamp is glowing. The filament is emitting light. OK, now we can change the resistance in this electrical circuit. And we will repeat this experiment with a smaller resistance. And therefore, a larger current will flow, and the lamp will glow, and the light will have more intensity. You will see more intense light. And the load will go down quicker, so that the power of the internal force, the power, the rate of work performance will be larger, and so it will move quicker, and the lamp will glow. Uh, OK, let's go. And the lamp glows better. <laughs> you see it? OK. So this is a demonstration of internal forces acting in a system of two bodies. And the internal force performs work, and the work can, be, uh, can result in both acceleration of the body and, uh, and some light emitted by the filament of this lamp. If we convert a part of this uh, energy, a part of the work performed by external forces into other sort of energy, other than mechanical energy. In this particular case, we convert mechanical energy and mechanical work into uh, electrical energy, and then into a heat energy, a heat uh, of the filament, and then finally into light emitted by a heated body, heated filament. <coughs> That's it. That's a demonstration of internal forces performing uh, some work in a system of two bodies. So uh, we have just demonstrated the importance of this term, the work performed by internal forces in a system of some of different bodies. We have observed this particular term in our demonstrational experiment. The work performed by internal forces. <coughs>
Okay. Next, we will consider some important issues related to the definition of potential energy and the definition of conservative forces and conservative fields. And there are many, many important results <coughs> in this topic. More than percent, no? Okay. So um, suppose we have a material point and some force acts on this point and the point moves along some trajectory and the force performs work. And how to calculate this work I explained in the beginning of this lecture we have to divide this trajectory into small portions and calculate work on each small portion, on each small displacement, and then find the sum of all works performed uh, through the motion of this body along uh, an arbitrary curve. What if the curve is closed? What if the body moves in arbitrary way but final point coincides with the initial point. Sometimes that happens, and such a trajectory is called a closed trajectory if, it's, if the end of this motion coincides with the beginning. And in order to calculate work, we have to, we have to, uh, use the same integral taken along the curved trajectory f times dr so this is some force acting on the particle and this is a small displacement dr and we have to calculate this integral that is the sum of all works of all work elements along this trajectory. And in order to underline that the motion is a closed motion, that is along the closed line, in order to underline that the beginning of this curve coincides with the end of this curve, in order to underline this fact, in mathematics they use such a symbol, an integral taken along a closed curve. <coughs> That is a curvilinear integral along arbitrary closed path of the particle. This is just a definition. This, I, I introduce this symbol so that you don't be afraid of this symbol whenever you, you find it, whenever you see it in any textbook. You must understand that this is just an integral taken along any closed curvilinear trajectory. So we now have a five-minute interval. <coughs> 
So, by definition, if this integral equals 0, sometimes that happens, then such a field of forces acting here is called conservative field. And uh, forces acting on a particle are called conservative forces if the integral of such expression taken over closed path of the particle is 0. And if this integral is 0 for any closed path, the particle could have moved along uh, some different path, for example, along this path or along any other closed path. If any closed path, if any closed path results in a total work performed by the force along this closed path equal to zero, then such a force is called conservative. There are many conservative forces in nature. Also, there are many non-conservative forces. Examples. For example, a force of friction, is it conservative? No, because if I move the piece of chalk, I perform work against forces of friction, and the forces of friction are always directed against the velocity. And so I have to push, I have to push this object so that it moves. And if I go along a circular trajectory, along a closed path, then I will perform positive work, which is obviously larger than zero. And this uh, force of friction turns out to be non-conservative force, because such an integral will be non-zero. Now examples of conservative forces. A force of gravity, for example. If I take a load of a body of mass m, then there will be a force of gravity mg. And if, suppose I move this body upward, and then here, and then downward, and then to the original point, if I arrange for such a closed path of motion, what will happen with, with the work? The force of gravity will produce some work. And here, the force of gravity is constant. It's equal to mg, and it's directed downward. And the displacement is directed upward. So the displacement, let's, uh, let it be delta r. And on this first, on this first uh, part of the trajectory, let's, uh, let's denote this, uh, the first part, and the second part, and the third part, and the fourth part. The four sides of this rectangular figure, of this rectangular path. And the force on, on the first part, the work will be equal to scalar product of f times delta r. f is directed downward and delta r is directed upward. So the angle between the displacement delta r and the force will be 180 degrees. And the cosine of angle 180 degrees will be minus 1. So the force will be equal to minus f delta r. On the second part, on the upper part, the force will be directed downward, and the displacement is horizontal. The angle between the displacement and the force will be 90 degrees. And therefore, on the second part, the work will be 0. On the third part of our trajectory, the displacement is directed downward, and the force is also directed downward. So the angle between these two vectors will be 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1. So the work performed on the third part of this trajectory will be equal to f delta r.
the same delta R as on the first part, on the first section. And uh, on the last section of our trajectory, the work will again be equal to zero because the displacement and the force will be perpendicular to one another. So the total work must be the sum of all works, what is written here. This is the integral taken along the curved path. That is the sum of all works performed when we move along the closed uh, path. The sum of all works, the total work, which is the sum of all works, which will be A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4, that will be equal to what? Zero and zero and minus F delta R and plus F delta R, that will be zero. So in the uniform field of gravity, if we move a body along the closed trajectory and if we end at the same point with where we started, then the total work performed by the forces of gravity will be zero. Certainly, we could have moved the body along some arbitrary trajectory, and it's easy to show that in this case, the work will be also zero. Because each small displacement, delta R, and uh, the force of gravity, F, will be entered into the calcula calculation uh, formula for calculation as a uh, scalar product. And if we take scalar product, we will, we will have to take into account only the vertical component of displacement. We will not have to take into account the horizontal component of displacement. Only vertical component will be uh, important for this formula. And if we start, if we end at the same point where we have started, then the total vertical displacement will be equal to total, total, uh, total vertical displacement up and down will be equal to zero if we end at the same point. So whatever arbitrary trajectories here, this formula will be again satisfied. The total work of the uh, gravity force will be zero along the uh, closed path of this body. Another example, central force. The central force is the force which is always directed to one and the same point, which is called the center. So if I put the particle here, the force will be directed to the center. If I put the particle at any other point here, for example, the force again will be directed to the center. And the only thing important for such force will be the distance between the particle and the center. And the force acting on the particle F will be a function of distance R. Such a force is called a central force. A central force is always directed along, along the line which connects the particle and the given center. This force may be a force of attraction or a force of repulsion or some combination. Sometimes there is a combination of both forces. For example, it may be attraction at large distances and it may be repulsion at smaller distances. That is the force of interaction of molecules between molecules. But anyway, if the force is directed always towards this center, one and the same point in space, then such a force is called a central force. And the field of such forces is called a central field. There are many examples of central fields, like electrostatic interaction, central forces, gr gravitational interaction, again, central force, and interaction between molecules, sometimes also central force. So what happens in the central force? If, if I take the particle and allow it to go along some uh, 
arbitrary trajectory. Let's consider it here. That's a center, and that's the initial point for my particle, and it goes along an arbitrary trajectory, and then it ends at the same point. What happens? If the particle shifted from this point to the final point, the shift is delta r, the displacement of the particle, and this is the radius r. And the force is acting along the radius. Then the scalar product of f dr will be equal to the magnitude of force f and the magnitude of dr times cosine alpha angle between the force and the displacement. If we look at this picture, we understand that delta r times cosine alpha equals this change of ra radius. Well, let it be dr, the change in the distance of particle to the center. If particle shifted from the initial point to final point, the distance increased by d delta r. Because we have to take, we have to multiply dr, actual displacement, by cosine alpha. And that means that no matter how much the particle shifted in uh, the direction perpendicular to radius, the only thing which matters is the change in the distance to the center. The only thing which is important, the elementary work, delta A, will be F delta R. The only thing important is the change of distance of this particle from the center. And it means that if we start motion from single point, from this point, and then after a closed, after performing a closed pass, we end at the same point, then the total work performed along this curved path will be equal to zero because the distance, initial distance and final distance, uh, initial distance coincides with the final distance. And total change in distance will be zero if we start from this point and end in this point. If we moved along the, sur along the closed path, then the final distance coincides with the initial distance. And what is important for for work, I, I, what is important, we have just discovered, that important is just the change in the distance. And if the final change in, in distance is zero, then the total work will be zero. And when particle moves here, the total work may be positive, and when it moves backward, the po total work will be negative. And finally, finally, we two positive and negative parts will cancel each other, and final work will be zero. So if we have any central field, then this field will resemble this quality. Whatever closed path of a particle is in this field, the work of, this, of such forces, of such central forces, on the closed path will be zero. And if so, if the work along any closed trajectory of motion is zero, then such a field is called conservative, and such forces are conservative. So what we have proven is just is that as any central field is a conservative field. <laughs>
OK, let's consider some conservative field. And we move in this field from original point P, point P, and we move the particle from this point along arbitrary curved trajectory to final point O. This should not be the center of the central field. It's a different, it's a different point. OK, let it be point B in order not to confuse this point with the center of the central field. We move from point B to point B. If this is a conservative field, then if we move, if we return to the same point P, then the total work performed will be zero. What does it mean? It means that the work performed on the first section of our trajectory equals the work performed and the work performed on the second trajectory in total will give you zero. Total work performed is zero. For any curved path of the particle. The particle could have chosen other trajectory. For example, we could we could move the particle along some other trajectory like this one, and then any other trajectory backward. For any two trajectories, the work will be, the total work will be zero. Now let's choose some other trajectory from this point here, and I will call it not one, but one prime. And the back, the back way will be the same, like section two. So we have for, for the path for the section one and two, we have this relationship. And for the section one prime and two, the same relationship. So A1 prime, the work performed on another section, on another, another curved trajectory plus A2 will remain zero. The second pass, the second part of uh, uh, the second part of trajectory will be the same, but the first part may be changed in any way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the result. The total work along the closed path must be zero. So if we compare these two equations, we obtain simple thing. A1 must be equal to A1 prime. And it means that if I go from point P to point B, then whatever trajectory I choose, probably the, the, the straight one, or some curved trajectory, or some very complicated trajectory, whatever trajectory I choose, if I start from point B and end at point B, then the work produced by conservative forces will be the same. It will not depend on the type of trajectory I choose. The work will depend on the only on the initial point and final point. The work will be the same. It means that in such a conservative field, the work performed by forces of this field does not depend on the trajectory. It depends only on the final initial point and final point. And it means that the work performed may be chosen to characterize point P. And the work performed on the first part of this uh, on the first part of this trajectory may be used to characterize point P. And if this work is always the same, no matter how the particle moves to point B, then this work may be taken as some characteristic of point P, of initial point. This work does not depend on the trajectory. So it may be attributed to point P. 
And we may forget about the trajectory. We don't pay attention to trajectory. We know that whatever trajectory we take, the work performed will be the same. So we forget about the trajectory. We just take this point P and we attribute to this point a physical quantity which is called a potential energy. And the potential energy at point P, by definition, is work performed when we, we move from point P to some other fixed point B, fixed point in space. And this fixed point B is called a reference point uh, with, with respect to which we calculate the potential energy. For example, in a gravity field, we may choose as a reference point any point on the level, for example, on the ground level, or any point in, in space. It may be the initial point to calculate the potential energy from this point. Also, in central field, we may choose any point, for example, this one, to calculate the potential energy of all other points with respect to this point. And we may choose this point even at the infinity to calculate the potential energy of any other point with respect to potential energy at the infinity. So the main thing is to choose some final point with respect to which a potential energy will be calculated for any other point in space. Why can we introduce the potential energy as a characteristic of a particular point? Why? Only because the work performed on a particle moving from point P to point B does not depend on the trajectory of motion. Whatever trajectory we choose, the work performed will be the same. And that means that the potential energy of at this particular point is some characteristic of this point which just not, does not depend on the trajectory of motion. So we have introduced the potential energy at a given point in space as the work performed when a particle moves from this point to some reference point B, some point where the potential energy is zero. Obviously, here the potential energy is zero because to move a particle from very close point to point B uh, will require very small work. And if the initial point and final point uh, are here at point B, then the work needed to move the particle is zero because the displacement is zero. So the potential energy at point B is zero, and the potential energy at any other point is defined by definition as the work performed on moving this particle from the initial point to the reference point. That's the definition of potential energy in general case. Okay, let's consider this definition uh, of potential energy in a particular case. For example, we have an x-axis and point B is here, the reference point, coincides with the zero of x-axis, with the origin, coincides with the, with the origin. And here is some point x. And what is the potential energy here? What is the potential energy at point x? By definition, this is the work which should be performed to move a material point under consideration from point x to point b. From point x to point b. And this is some force. times dx, and we must divide this section into small displacements dx. Each small displacement is dx. And then we have to sum up all these works performed on small displacements. That is, we have to take the integral. 
and the small amount of work, if we take small amount of work, that will correspond to a small change in potential energy as a function of x. And that will be given by F. X component of force, I consider only X components times dx. And as we, we have to sum the displacements from point x backward to 0, then each displacement dx is negative. Each displacement dx is negative. We go from x to point 0. And if forces are positive, if forces fx is uh, positive, then that will be minus f dx because, because, the, uh, because the positive, uh, because the positive force will, will correspond to negative change in potential energy. If we consider other, some other axis, for example, y-axis, then again, we will obtain similar expression. The change in potential energy as a function of y will be equal to minus f y component of force dy. And the same expression if we move along z axis, then change in potential energy along z axis will be equal to minus f z d z. In general case, if potential energy in space depends on three coordinates, both x and y and, and z, if, if potential energy is the function of all three coordinates, x, y, z, then we can arrange for small displacements along each axis. And the total change in potential energy will be just the sum of changes along each axis. And the changes along each axis are indicated here. So the total change will be minus fx dx minus y component of force dy minus z component of force dz. Uh, in mathematics, differential of function, if it's the function of x, a differential of function u as a function of x is uh, denoted by a derivative u with respect to x dx, which is du dx and dx. Right? In mathematics, are you familiar with such a notation? Do you understand it? OK. If we have not a single variable, x, but many variables, like here, x, y, z, then such a derivative will be denoted by somewhat different symbol. It will be not a du dx. It will be the same du dx, but the dif differential sign, differential symbol will be such a uh, rounded symbol. That is just to indicate that the, the meaning is the same, but the first notation applies to a single variable function, a function of one variable x. And another notation ap is applied when the function u depends on many different variables, like in x, y, z. The meaning is the same. So this expression can be written as du dx dx plus du dy dy plus du dz differential z. That is just 
the mathematical notation of a derivative of u with respect to x variable. And this is the mathematical notation of derivative of u with respect to y variable. And this is the same derivative, but with respect to another variable, with respect to z variable. These are just uh, mathematical notations. Comparing these two lines, we may obtain that the x component of force acting on a particle may be expressed as minus du dx, where u is a function of x, y, z, is a complicated function of all three coordinates. It's a function of space point, a point in space, a point which has three coordinates. And the y component of force is minus du dy. And the z component of force is minus du dz. So if we know the potential energy as a function of space point in three-dimensional space, then by taking such derivatives, we may calculate the components of a force acting on a particle in this particular field. The force acting in this particular field. The field is described by a potential energy. And if we know the potential energy as a function of all three coordinates, then we may calculate all the components of force. And in this case, the vector of force will be equal to a unit vector i x component of force, unit vector j, y component of force, and unit vector k, z component of force. And this can be written using the expressions obtained as minus i du dx plus j du dy plus vector k unit vector k du dz. And this is usually written as, this can be written as, I will, I will perform some strange thing now. I will write it down as ddx plus vector j ddy plus vector k ddz. And here we have function u as a function of three coordinates, x, y, z. So I have taken this function u out of the round brackets. And what remains in the round brackets is called an operator. It's an operator acting on a function of three space coordinates. This operator is usually denoted in physics and mathematics as a triangle turned upside down, a triangle. And this operator is called nabla. So finally, we, we may write this formula, this awkward formula, can be written in a more concise manner that the total force equals minus nabla u. And u is the potential energy depending on three coordinates, x, y, z. You may find this formula in many textbooks on physics. Don't be afraid of this operator nabla. Just recall that this operator is nothing more than the sum of derivatives taken, the derivatives taken with respect to x and y and z. And the function which we differentiate is u. u is the potential energy. Potential energy 
is different in different points of space. It depends on x, y, z, because it's a function of space point. It's different. It depends on. It's different in different space points. It depends on x, y, z. It's a function of three independent variables. And that is just the concise way to put this formula, to use this formula. Whenever you see operator nabla, don't be afraid of it. Just recall that this is a sum of three derivatives, nothing more. Also, sometimes uh, this expression is written as minus grad u. Grad is a gradient, gradient, which is another notation, another way to denote. Th it's the same as Nabla operator. Gradient is just the same way to put the same idea, to put this idea, to express it shortly. So you may use, you may encounter the first formula or the second formula, the first formula with operator Nabla, Nabla or the second formula with gradient. Don't be afraid of it. It's just the same thing. It's the same thing. And the meaning of it, meaning of it is here, is explained here. And people use this short uh, formula, short way to short way to write down such a lengthy expression lengthy and awkward expression. It's inconvenient to repeat this expression many times in your text. It's much more convenient to, to use this very short notation. It's just, just for the purpose of convenience, nothing more. It's just a notation. So, Next thing we have to consider if we have time, I'm afraid we don't have time, but anyway, we will write down Koenig's theorem. The next issue we have to consider the next topic will be a Koenig's theorem. <coughs> Certainly we have no time to finish this, uh, but I will just start it here today and I will finish it next time. So Koenig's theorem considers an interesting question how the kinetic energy of a system of material particles change if we consider this kinetic energy from a different system of reference, re reference system. So we have a uh, first reference system x, y, z. I will, I will denote it by k. And we have another reference system I will denote it by k prime. And there is some material point here which has, which is uh, characterized by radius vector r in the first reference system and it's characterized by radius vector r prime in the second reference system. And the second reference system can be described by radius vector capital R with respect to the first radius system, first reference system. Uh, this triangle means that vector R equals capital R plus R prime. I will start consideration of this. I will start considering this Koenig's theorem next time. I will start it from this particular point. Okay, that's all. That's the end of our lecture. Thank you.